All right, let's move on to seven minutes in heaven. These are our favorite scenes in the movie, and there were a lot of good scenes. I'll say that. Really? Yeah, there were a lot of good scenes. Saw. There were a lot of scenes that weren't necessary. Jesus a lot Christ. Of, All right, well, well this not, that's not that segment. Okay. Jesus Christ. I got, I got four. How many you got? <laughs> Six. Okay, so you go first and last. Um, I'm going to... Okay, let's let's get this out of the way. The the, the you, you'll see. You, you can call it the first one. Tuck. Oh yeah, yeah. Tucker and Jackson. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, I, obviously you guys saw the intro. Hey, we need to take care of Boma first. But you know what? I think somebody already did. <laughs> <laughs> so so guys, there is uh seven minutes in heaven. Gotcha. Like these are our favorite scenes that make us feel like you don't to to us like you say. Uh, I've smoked marijuana before. I've had liquor before. So there are certain things that get you out of your element. But we'll tell you this. When you truly are doing your true life's work, there's nothing that we like to call it a natural high. That natural high, number one, it's not even free because it calls sacrifice. But when you get it, it's the most amazing thing in the world. And to me, to see two legends on the screen at the same time, put it this way, I'm, I'm, it's like the, 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 the unholy trinity of film. Mm -hmm. I have Quint a Quint Tarantino shot. Sam Jackson and Chris Tucker happening all at the same fucking time, and again we're combining. That's why I think me and you go so go back so so much with this is because there's so many similarities between the movies that we're not even talking about. Yeah. So with that being said, like, dude, the scene between listen, that motherfucker says, listen, he said, man, I need a favor that requires me to go out tonight. Like they're both steady, like it's like a chessboard, and let me like I need something. That okay. Does it need me there? And so when they come down here, like, man, I ain't getting no motherfucking trunk for no motherfucking minutes. Like, like, it's a dirty ass. He, he listed every, like, I mean, he like, and why did I help you? And he was like, man, I know you helped me, but you catching a nigga off. Go off this I don't want to get in the trunk. I didn't want to spend 10K to get you out of prison. I'm not shooting anyone. You don't have to shoot. Just hold it. Don't get the idea. Hey, hey, hey. And you rap that motherfucker. Like, he's giving them motivational speeches on how to do it, man. It is blowing my mind. So that's that's one of the best ones. That's man. how badass Ordell is, is that he puts a gun in his hands and tells him, as soon as that trunk opens, you come out shooting or you come out with the gun. I know you truly believe that because you haven't called him Ordell for the whole episode. So now I know he's making you feel it now. Oh, when you, yeah. When, when I open the trunk, you rap that motherfucker. <laughs> That's actually my my first one, so uh, I'll move past that. The, okay. uh, but yeah, to speak on that though, the the way that, like, I have been there, where like, all right, I'm home for the night. I just smoked. <laughs> I'm not trying to go like no. I, it's always shut down time. I'm home. I'm high. What are you doing? And he said that. <laughs> yeah. He said, "Man, I'm home. I'm high." <laughs> it doesn't even happen. And that's why my brother talked about like, like the the dialogue, the wordplay. Like, listen, man, I'm not saying no. I'm being honest with you. Like, I love you so much. I'm home. I'm high. And why are you home? Yeah. And why are you high? I'm like, oh. Shit. <laughs> that just cracks me up because to to Chris Tucker that is actually a good excuse to him. Like correct. this is a coming valid reason. Like yeah, they're yeah, coming off Friday and everything. One hundred percent correct, sir. All right, so yeah, my f I think probably my favorite scene in the movie would have to be when um, go. You know, I'm just playing with you. The split screen leading up to the reveal that Jackie took Max's gun just in time to show it. You know, the gun pre like what what is that? It feels like a gun pressed up against my dick. And then she's like, now remove your hands from around my throat. And he, the well, way there's he one just, more word that came back to that. What's Nika. It? Yeah, see, I don't... <laughs> I, well, I know you, see, he doesn't even write it. He won't, not only does he not say it, he doesn't write it. Let that be a lesson for you, America. After I die, nobody's going through my competition book being like, yeah, we always knew that Third and Godfrey was a closeted racist. <laughs> But then, you know, the way uh, Ordell's character, or the way Ordell is standing there at the window, like, um, girl, you know I'm just, pl like, he immediately switches gears to, I was about to kill her, to, girl, you know I'm just playing with you. Gloves. You need to stop all that. <laughs> See, that's what they do. Speak with them cops. They got black on black. Shut your raggedy ass up and sit your ass down. And you could tell right there in that moment, it's such, a, it's such an entertaining scene, but it's also very informative because it tells you that... Jackie knows Ordell on the level like she is not even hearing his bullshit for a second. Jackie and who and just like Simone knew mm -hmm. Ordell's bullshit. <laughs> Simone just didn't work yeah. at Cabo Air. And, and Melanie. They're all the all the women. In so all the women are already plotting out. against them. Yeah. Ah, they, Fox Force Three. Yeah. <laughs> good one, man. Very good. But speaking of Melanie, um, when he looks at him and says he looks in the back. <laughs> looks in the back of the van. He's like. Where's Melanie? Yeah. Like, that whole, uh, where's Melanie scene? Like, now, mind you, 
he checked for the money first. No, no, no. It was Melody. He was like, where's Melody? And then he checks for the money. And then immediately he essentially said he should. Uh, for him, like he says, my ass may be dumb, but I'm not no dumb ass. He immediately starts. He, if it, One thing we cannot say, he was strategic. Mm -hmm. He had it planned out. And so he was like, wait a minute. Okay. He thought it was a double, double, double cross. What he was not prepared for was that scene that most people won't even remember from the film. I know you remember it, but most people won't. Is the scene with Robert and it's the most where Robert is the most dialogue he has in the film when they're in the bar. And I still told you I think it's the bar from Pulp Fiction. I don't, we don't know, but it's him. He was like, man, I said, remember early they, they pay it off early in the movie. He said Samuel just says I get high at night after all my business is done. Mm -hmm. uh, you might as well put that in the Bible for me because that makes me feel that is one of those models. But with that being said. They then show him later on at night getting high, getting fucked up, and then he said, "Robert De Niro, like you trust Melanie around your money." He was like, "I, I, I get it. that bitch trying to play you against me." He did. Yeah. <laughs> mm. You don't get all serious here with me. So my whole point was he knew that okay, on one point, like okay, Robert De Niro did, uh, has already told me that she's trying to play me. Mm -hmm. Now I don't see this bitch in the van. So either one or two things are happening. Either Lewis is being 100% honest with me. Are they trying to double cross me? Like the double, double cross. Like he told me about what they were going to do. But then he thought about it. He was like, wait a minute. This man ain't the man he used to be. So I got I got to let him go. So that whole where's Melanie scene. Like, like, like me and you are friends, man. Like we were friends before film or anything. And like it's like it's like either you, like me seeing you like 20, 30 years from now. We're trying to do something. like, And it's not as serious as killing you. But like me having to say I'll never work with you again to me, which is essentially kill, killing you to me. Yeah. Because it's like, damn, what happened to you? You mm -hmm. used to be beautiful. Like you don't believe no more, man. Like I, to me, that was such an emotional scene between two emotional characters. Like he shot this man. And it's not like, think about it. He didn't make it painful. He didn't shoot him in the face. He didn't beat his ass. Mm -hmm. He just shot him twice, man. He was like, man, what? It really hurt him. Like, seriously hurt him. Yeah, and there was, like, a really subtle buildup to that relationship development where you're watching. It's almost like Ordell is too busy and consumed in everything that's happening to really, like, like, you can kind of see subtle looks the way he looks at Lewis when he's doing Man, look at me things. when I'm talking to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's like, but he... And uh, I, you could, like, see, like, maybe in the back of uh, Ordell's mind, it's like, all right, when the time comes, Lewis has never let me down. He's always been there. He's always done what he's supposed to do. I'm not feeling too good about the, where he's at in life right now, but when the time comes, he's going to Lewis up. And then all of his worst fears are proven right when Lewis shows up with no money and no mail. It's the, it's the, it's the true textbook definition of being an enabler. When you know that person can no longer do it, but your love, you're blinded by your love for them. Mm -hmm. You want him to be that person again. Like you're trying to show him, like, like you're an animal. Yeah. Roar. Uh, I'm glad he enabled him because it gave one of my other favorite scenes is when, <coughs> when Lewis is walking through the mall and coming out looking through the parking lot. Even better than when he when he shoots Mel for continually berating him about not being able to find the car and being a f up. The moment that's even better than that is when he warns her when they're walking out of the mall and he puts he thinks about hitting her. He's like, he's like, listen, Mel, shut the f up, shut the f up. Like, he puts the fist and like he wants to. Ooh, if this was thirty years Give ago. Give me the bag, you <laughs> mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he had, that was so much restraint, and then all restraint was gone. Like, I'm, bang, bang. It was such a perfect... She uh, should have won a fucking, not, not, not an award, but a not, like a nod for... That shit, she was really fucking with him. Like, mm -hmm. she crossed into color. Like, every man in every spectrum, whether you're a pygmy, Indian, whatever, she was that bitch, man. Yeah. Damn, man. All right. Well, um, the scene with um, uh, what one of the other ones for me was Ma when Max Cherry. You talked about Max Cherry surprising you at every turn. Mm -hmm. Talk about the balls on you, man, to go to this motherfucker's house, not even his house, Sharonda's house, mm -hmm. and you come typical. I'm sorry, guys. This is the, this is the one stereotype. It's true. The typical white person's not. <laughs> Damn, motherfucker! You acting like you motherfucker. Police. And yeah. the reason why I say it's a typical white person now, that's a callback. Maybe Tarantino saw uh, Menace to Society. When the white guy goes from the insurance to, uh, not Don Cheeto's house, uh, damn it, uh, Clifton Powell's house. Thank you. Damn, Mr. Royal. Bang, 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 bang. Boom. In that movie, he said, damn, motherfucker, you, got, you, got, motherfucker, you know you'll come up in ghetto before motherfucking 12 o'clock. He said some, <laughs> some shit like that. Like, damn, this is stereotypical. White people don't know how to knock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. See, they're too <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'm sorry. Make yourself known. 
more importantly, like I say, he goes into this guy's house, or not this Sharada's house, and and and, and here comes a naiveness. Like, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing. Because mm-hmm. if you went to this, it, it, to me, that he was just, it wasn't that he was courageous. He was just really just being blindly stupid because he goes generally to try to give Ordell his money. He's like, hey, motherfucker, what you doing? Like, he could have got shot right there. I would have shot the motherfucker. And he's so calm. He, he doesn't turn red. Of course he's fucking calm. Yeah. <laughs> My last favorite moment, my favorite scene is uh, the f- when she one-ups the cops, when Jackie Brown one-ups the cops and pulls the second switch with the Delano bag. And what really makes that scene for me is, is you're kind of getting it from Max's perspective, watching him watch everything that's happening, knowing what's going to happen before it happens. So you're kind of getting the clues that something else is up before it even happens. And you just get to kind of bask in it the way he does watching it all transpire from from afar i thought that was a and it was just like a classic like oceans 11 um just like a type of heist scene like oh there's something else going on here than what we've been told in the narration and speaking of heist uh that's of course why we're dressing all black tonight homage to that and that's the uh like because we both feel like we're gonna steal the show and it's crazy. We talked about how bad this is going to be. Surprisingly, it hasn't been that bad. I mean, granted, we I think we because we knew that we we're going to be so angry. We've already said our piece, but we're for the. Sh- it's turning out great for the show. Yeah. My favorite, one of my favorite scenes, if not my favorite scene, was the scene between in that same club, which I still think is this the club from uh, Pulp Fiction. Can't confirm it or not. It's when Pam Grant and Sam Jackson are meeting and she's explaining to him the plan. She was like, mm-hmm. um, I'm managing to get your money out of Mexico under the nose of the cops. So I'm a manager. I get 15%. He's like, all I'm going to give you is 10 So that scene right there to me lets me know. It shows such a beautiful woman's intelligence, a beautiful black woman's intelligence. To say, I'm putting it all on the f***ing line. And it resonates to the first time we see her in the movie. Like, we're on 110th Street. Go back and listen to that song. It's telling you, like, you gotta do what you gotta do. Like, it's not perfect. Like, I wish that we were all born into perfect situations. But guess what? I'm almost happy we didn't because it it sharpens us. It defines mm-hmm. us. And so here I see it's, it's strategic if we said Sam Jackson has been in this whole movie. Here is her undermining Everyone, but not everyone, everyone that deserves it. And yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Fresh, but you've heard me mention it at least two times a season. I always love when someone is an underdog and considered to not be the smartest, but can outsmart everyone. So to me, that's my one of my top scenes, if not my favorite scene in the film. I agree. Um, is, that, is that your last one? Yeah. All right. Uh, what was your favorite scene in Jackie Brown? Uh, or or Pulp Fiction, if you want to throw those in nope, the comments. No, cause we, no, because we're doing that in season two. All right, so let us know what your favorite scenes are in Jackie Brown in so the sweet. comments. And... Find us in all these links that's coming up right now. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.